win in your in. How can the Pelicans slow down LeBron James in the play-in? The adjustment the Pelicans need to get Zion Williamson going and more in a live in-person episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are the number one Pelicans podcast, so please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Join almost 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube here. We are live in person at Mid-City Yacht Club with the Pels 12, getting everyone set for the play-in tournament against LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers. I've got three great guests here, Will Guillory, Aaron Summers, and Rel Myers. We're going to cover everything you want to know about all of this here. Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side and it's a big, uh, and I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mo mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends, download Monopoly Go now for free on the Apple Store or Google Play. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. If you're an everydayer, that means you listen Monday through Friday. So if you're following along on YouTube, let me know in the comments down below. So let's start it with Will Guillory, beat writer for The Athletic, at Will Guillory on Twitter. Will, thanks for uh, taking the time here, man. Ah, man, I appreciate you for having me, man. Shout out to you for putting this together. No, this was a lot of fun. You've been a guest a number of times on throughout the yeah. season, so we had to get you on for this. So let's, let's dive right into it with the Los Angeles Lakers beating the Pelicans 124-108 in the Smoothie King Center on Sunday. The Pelicans falling to seventh from that. What's your, what's your overall assessment of that game? Oh, ugly. First and foremost, <laughs> it was pretty bad. I mean, it, it's, it's something that we've seen a lot with this team where they go on a the road, they look amazing, Zion does a lot of great things, they make some great adjustments, and then they come back home, there's a lot of hype, you feel the excitement, and then it all kinds, kind of falls apart. I think, you know, it's so crazy this year for this team to have 49 wins and never have a winning streak longer than four games. It's just the ups and downs. You see how really good they can be when they are playing at their best but it's just so difficult for them to sustain it for whatever reason. And it's weird because this year they've been able to have some, you know, luck with the health. They've been able to have Zion and B.I. together so much, uh, but they just struggled to have that consistency and to really show up in big moments at home. Yeah, when you look at the starting lineup with the team, right, it's, it's a, got a net rating of basically zero. The top mm -hmm. three lineups are either slightly negative or more or less zero. It's tough to win in the NBA. So one, to get 49 wins when you have that kind of inconsistency for your starting group is is somewhat impressive, but when the playoffs start to matter, the games start to matter a little bit more and you need to rely on those starters. When you're not getting guys like Zion Williamson, Brandon Ingram, CJ McCollum working really well together, like what's kind of been the problem with that? Or are there things they could do going into this game on Tuesday night that maybe there's adjustments, tweaks they can make to kind of get good games from all of those guys? Yeah, I think the thing is they've tried for a big portion of the season to figure it out. And I think over the past few weeks, Willie Green has just said, you know what, we're just going to throw it out and we're just going to go small. We're going to play Larry Dance at five more we're going to play Zion at five more and we think that's really closer to what we want our identity to be and I think they've had a lot of success doing it but unfortunately with that Lakers team it's just really tough to play small with LeBron and AD and mm -hmm. Rui that's really their advantage is they come in big they want to attack you in the paint LeBron gets downhill they're throwing lobs to AD so I think with the way the Pels have kind of found a new identity, it works going against the Suns. You look really good, or against Sacramento, or even against the Warriors. But I think this particular matchup is really tough just because of what LeBron and AD bring. Of course, they can make it work. Uh, I, th I think that game yesterday, they just weren't locked in. You saw it from the beginning. They weren't communicating on defense. They weren't doing the little things. And I think LeBron kind of set the tone early, and it was just off to the races at that point. But I do think this particular matchup is really difficult, and they kind of have to be on point just because it's not going to come as easy with, you know, Zion at the five. Yeah, it, it really just seems like, you know, there's some teams you don't match up well with, yeah. and the Lakers definitely seem to be a problem with it. There's a little bit of, like, rock, paper, scissors when it comes to it. You know, the Pelicans don't match up well with the Lakers. They match up really well with the Sun, uh, with the Kings. Oh, they love the Kings. They love the Kings. And then, oddly, the Kings always beat the Lakers, too, so there's this big kind of circle going on here with everything. Yeah. Like, you mentioned the points in the paint. You know, at halftime, it was 50-12 to 12 for the Lakers there with a huge advantage. Pelicans have had a good defense all season long, finish the, finishing the season ranked sixth. What happened there? 
I think a lot of it, like I said, they just weren't on point. A lot of it came off of turnovers going the other way. 19 turn- not, yeah, turnovers in that game. Not getting matched up in transition. We saw a few times guys getting open shots. You know, LeBron just getting downhill and nobody getting in front of him. Like I said, I think if they come in with the right mental attitude, I think they can solve a lot of the problems they had yesterday. I think just having a full practice, being able to sleep in their own beds, getting locked in for this game, uh, I think it's going to help them a lot. Just uh, Not even just making any adjustments, just coming in with a better attitude, a better mindset. Uh, but I do think, you know, like I said, just the, the, the way the game is matched up, the, the, the pain is going to be an issue regardless. I think we're going to get into this. Well, you might as well start it now. There's going to be a lot of Jonas Valanciunas <laughs> talk and, and how much he can help with this problem. I think, you know, obviously JV helps them in the paint. He gives them more size. It's a different type of matchup on AD, but I'm not sure he's the type of defender that's going to solve this problem and keep LeBron at the paint or make AD not score 30 on you every time he comes in New Orleans. Uh, but I do think – like I said, the way that this team flies around when they're active, when they're communicating, when they're locked in, they can eliminate a lot of the problems that size presents. But they got to do those things. It's not just we show up and it's going to happen. You got to really go out there and commit to it. And I don't think they were really committed to it yesterday. No, the, the Lakers kind of came out and punched them in the mouth and they just didn't really seem to have yeah. any response to that. They kind of lost the aggression that's made them really good, both on offense and defense, I thought, with that as well. And then you saw LeBron just getting into the paint, either someone cutting baseline or someone in the dunker spot and him just dumping it off to them. He had 13 assists at halftime, I think. And at that point, the game was essentially over and there wasn't really much coming back for it. So you think it's just a mentality thing that if they communicate, kind of get back to the core of what they do? Yeah, I think you saw uh, in that second quarter an adjustment. We see a lot from Willie Green where they're struggling to stop you from getting into the paint. So they start playing zone, right? They start allowing those guys to pressure you at the top of the key. Maybe we can force some steals. Maybe we can get in transition. And what did LeBron do? He immediately hit Rui Hachimori on two baseline cuts for wide open dunks. Mm -hmm. That's just communication. That's just not paying attention to your man in the corner. That's stuff you can easily fix if you're locked in, if you're paying attention, if you're communicating. They, they, They got a whole lot of baskets like that yesterday where guys just weren't on the same page and I think if you can figure that stuff out big part of it is keeping Herb Jones out of foul trouble which I think <laughs> has quietly been a problem this year for them uh, as great a defender as Herb is and I think his activity is a big part of that kind of lifting everybody else up uh, but they got to come in and they got to be the team that's playing harder they got to be the team that's playing more physical and they got to be the team that's communicating because of the advantages that the Lakers bring. You know, they're not a great home team, but hopefully being at home gives them a little bit of an advantage. You mentioned kind of sleeping in your own bed. That kind of rest, I think, can go a long way with all of that, too. So let's, let's look at the offense when it comes to it. You know, LeBron started off defending Zion. That's a that's a good matchup for him, I think, right? He's got the mm-hmm. strength, the length to kind of slow down Zion, force some of those turnovers. Is there a way they can get Zion Williamson going, get his offense clicking a little bit early, or is there another way they need to go about doing it? I think for one, just Zion just got to commit to playing aggressive. I think last night he wasn't aggressive at all. For him to just have 12 points, I don't think that was a whole lot of what LeBron was doing. I think he just, just was passing up on shots a lot of times. He ends up with eight assists, which is good. You want Zion to be sharing the ball, but I think I want to see him kind of play with the same commitment he had in that Golden State game where the efficiency wasn't all the way there. He was missing some shots in the paint, but he was committed to attacking Draymond consistently and forcing Draymond to guard him. And I tweeted during the game, I think Draymond is one of the best guys in the league at staying in front of Zion, making him make tough shots. But at the end of the day, Zion can do that. Like, Zion can get to his spots. We see, we see him hitting the midi. We see him pulling he, up He, he took a threes. bunch of those, too, in, in this game against the Lakers, yeah. probably more so than he should have been doing. I think that's a useful tool to have. But when he was kind of relying on that early on, I don't think it's the way that he wants to be playing that aggressive style of ball. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, I don't love it as much as Joel Myers. I know my dude Joel <laughs> goes crazy when he sees Zion shooting the mid-range. But he, he's got to take more of those. I think he's just got to find ways to, to take more shots to force people to guard him and I think that's the one thing LeBron does really well he just gives him space he says hey if you want to dribble in if you want to take those shots go ahead and I think Zion has got to take it Uh, uh, one person I point to a lot is Giannis Antetokounmpo and we see Giannis throw up a lot of ugly jumpers they smack off the side of the backboard the air ball but he takes them Mm -hmm. he's not going to scare let you scare him away from taking those shots and even if they aren't going in you got to respect it and I think that's that's the that's the point Zion has to get to where even if I'm not knocking them down even if it look a little ugly at times I got to take them just to just to make you think a little bit when you guard me yeah no that makes a ton of sense well so let's get back into kind of the center position in Jonas Valanciunas Larry yeah. Nitschuk but we also got Cody Zeller minutes the other night too <laughs> you know is is there an answer for the center position on this roster 
Listen, I love Cody. I don't think Cody's the answer. We can start there. I, I started with Cody's that. On, great. On, on, Cody's on, great. For, for the everydayers, <laughs> I said, I was like, literally, no offense to the Zeller family. I don't know if there's an answer here, but I know the answer is not it Cody Zeller, Cody. unfortunately. Cody. Cody. So him getting... Um, you know, significant minutes kind of early in the second half is a little bit weird. Do you think it's as simple just throw the ball down to JV down low and see what happens? I mean, it ain't the 80s anymore. That's what I say to a lot of people. It ain't the 80s anymore. I love JV. I think uh, they. I think people want the, the commitment to JV more than like is what reality a lot of times. Yeah. The way you can play, especially the way this team wants to play. They want to play fast. They want to shoot more threes. I think throwing it into JV a lot kind of goes against a lot of that. But I do think in this particular matchup, I think they need to play GV a lot more than they did yesterday just to have a little bit more size on AD just to give him a different look help you a little bit with rebounding I think uh, but like I said I think they've done a really good job in, of establishing a small identity with Z at the five with Larry at the five and I think you saw during that road trip they got really comfortable playing that style and spreading the floor you saw Trey hitting a bunch of threes you saw CJ going crazy from the three-point line and I think that's the team they want to become but I don't think they necessarily have the five men on the roster to be that team right now. So I think that's more of a, a off-season conversation. Yeah. But I think as of right now, I think you're going to see a lot of Larry Nance. Uh, and I think you, you got to just see JV in this game. But I think if – and assuming they will, we're going to say they will get to the playoffs – uh, I think you're going to see a lot of Larry and a lot of Zion at the five, and I think that's the team they want to be. Yeah, I think that's kind of the expectation. Teams aren't doubling JV in the post. They did that in that Miami Heat game where they sent two at him, and then no team's really done that, and I think they're willing to let Jonas Valanciunas beat them if as long as it's not anyone else on the team here. So, Will, I appreciate you taking some time with me here. You'll be yeah. back for the live Q&A with everybody after the fact. We're going to get Aaron Summers up here next. So thanks, man, for being on here. I appreciate you for having me on. Give it up for Aaron. Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you, and it's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased in your life. I'm going to do a crossover with our Locked On Lakers host tomorrow that you'll see on the YouTube channel and on the uh, audio version as well, and it's great to get their perspective on things, how they view the team, and that unbiased perspective is really, really important for you in your life. So therapy can be different for everyone, and most most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams, and it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans, we want to invite you to NOLA Star Bar. It's right down the street from the Smoothie King Center for pre- and post-game libations. They play every Pelicans home game and away game throughout the season on their big screens. They have a pool table, video poker, an internet jukebox, and karaoke every Wednesday night. They also have over 100 worldwide spirits and a hefty selection of local beers. A true Pelicans fans bar, they even created and produced the Pelicans anthem called Fly, Pelicans Fly, complete with a music video. Join your fellow Pelicans fans at NOLA Star Bar at 212 Loyola Avenue, open seven days a week, 6 p.m. to 4 a.m., and check out the Pelicans Anthem Fly, Pelicans Fly on the NOLA Star Bar page on YouTube. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast covering everything you want, getting you set with a live in-person episode of Locked On Pelicans here for the play-in tournament against LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers. I've got Aaron Summers at Aaron E. Summers here with me, sideline reporter for Pelicans.com. Aaron, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, now. absolutely. This is so much fun. No, it's great to have people here. We love seeing all the Pelicans fans with everything. So so let's start kind of building off that loss like we did here with Will. Sure. Disappointing loss. You know, the Pelicans are at home for this game, kind of in a rematch for the Lakers. They had practice today. You were there. What was the kind of feeling in the building with everything after that? I don't think I've seen a practice that's been more focused, detailed, and pointed than this one was. There was not a, a lot of conversation on the side everybody was really locked in and there were so many moments throughout practice where they stopped things and they re-ran different plays and they made sure that they focused in on a certain 
player on the Lakers or, or however they were running something. If, he did, if Willie Green didn't like it in the first second that he saw something, then he made him run it again. So it was something that I hadn't seen before, not only in the way that they started, because when they were starting to warm up, you know, Willie was talking specifically to Brandon Ingram for quite some time, and then he moved on to talk to Herb, and then after that he went back to talk to Brandon, which during stretch he kind of usually leaves them alone, but it wasn't the case today. And then just throughout their, their offensive sets and then defensively, he really focused in on what they were doing defensively. Um, you know, the, uh, the PD group and, and mm -hmm. some of the other guys that were acting as the Lakers players were wearing different colored jerseys, which is something I've never seen before because they really wanted to make sure the Pelicans players immediately knew who Rui Hachimura was mm -hmm. or LeBron James or whoever they were make, pinpointing as the start of their offensive sets and who they needed to make sure they were locking in on. So it was really interesting practice to see that. And, um, you know, they brought out a whiteboard and like drew through things and, and wrote out their, their plays and stuff that was, again, never seen before. So they were doing a lot of things to make sure this team really understood the game plan going forward tomorrow. So it sounds like they're kind of, it's the postseason now for them, right? This yeah. is different than their regular season, normal practices. We've even heard people like Trey Murphy talk about they have a lot of joy in practice. They're having fun. This sounds like it was a whole lot more serious that they're they really locked it, locked Absolutely. on. Maybe. <laughs> and, um, but really kind of dialed up and kind of trying to make those right kind of adjustments. We've also seen this a little bit during the regular season too. When they have a quick turnaround from one team to the next. They got beaten pretty badly at home by the Phoenix Suns, but then went on the road and had a couple of key adjustments in the way they had C.J. McCollum shoot over drop coverage, the way mm -hmm. they defended guys like Devin Booker. You're pretty confident they're going to be able to come up with some things for this game here? Yeah, I mean, based off of what they practice, they are going to play things a little bit differently tomorrow, especially the pick and roll or how they cover LeBron at the top of the key. You know, there was a lot more focus on, on pressure and physicality and, and getting on him early in the set to make sure that he isn't able to pass it off 17 mm -hmm. times for a bucket because that was definitely a problem yesterday. You know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see the defensive intensity that they come with tomorrow because that has always been the focus for this team. They want to start on that end, and it was something that they were unable to do in yesterday's game, and I think it made them not be as – focused and effective on the offensive end. So they're at home, which I think worries a lot of people based off the splits here. We talk to them about that all the time, and it worries the team a little bit too, whether they say it doesn't publicly, you know, you can see it. They're like, man, I don't get it. You know, we've asked, Trey Murphy is very open about it. He's like, yeah, if any of you guys can tell me why I can't shoot threes as good as I can <laughs> on the road as I in here in the SKC, then please let me know. It, it seems really strange. So like, they don't really seem to have an idea because when you look at the team, they're doing very similar things. And for whatever reason, you know, they have the, the most road wins in the NBA mm -hmm. this season, more than a team like the Boston Celtics. But at home, they're basically 500 at this point. And it just seems so strange. And then you get the Los Angeles Lakers who are now in town for a couple of days, right? It's not like the team is just flying in day before the game, maybe a little bit tired for some of the travel. Does that make things worse a little bit? I know a lot of people have said that, hey, I would prefer to play mo majority of our playoff <laughs> games on the road because of the record and how good they have been on yeah. the road. And I get it. And unfortunately, you know, I think the Pelicans would rather play here. You would rather sleep at home. You would rather be on your home court, have your fans behind you. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about being on the road all of your focus is on the game and what you're doing. You don't have any outside distractions, and, and that could be what has helped them be so good on the road. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, maybe I, I was on with Gus Cattengill on ESPN Radio today. He made a joke. Maybe they just need to spend the night in a hotel or something like that. Rather That's what than they their do in the NFL. Beds, right? Like, see if that kind of has something to do with it. Uh, what about the rotation? We saw Brandon Ingram make his return from injury. Yeah. He played a little over 23 minutes of action. Do you expect his minutes to go up in this game? His minutes are definitely going to go up. He probably will play his normal amount of time. And the only thing that concerned me about his return is the fact that he didn't have any assists, which mm -hmm. is not the usual for Brandon. Usually he is the leading 
facilitator yeah, he leads on, he leads on the on team. The, the team and assists per game right. this season. And so he didn't do that, but I think he is trying to figure out when to be aggressive. And we saw him be aggressive and assert himself in that first quarter, five of nine from the floor, nine points. And then it kind of tapered off after that, as did his minutes. So hopefully with the increase in minutes, he will figure that out more. And talking to the players today, they said the same thing. And it is, it is about getting comfortable with each other and, and figuring out how you're playing with each other after not having him for an extended amount of time. He's also the type of guy that usually needs a game or two to kind of shake off some rust after being yeah. out, and he's been so out for almost a month. that quarter was awesome to see from mm -hmm. him. But and he, he carried them, and they're going to need that because the Lakers are going to try and take away the rim for Zion Williamson. That mid-range shot of his, when he can get to his spots, is going to be open, and they need him to knock those down to try and space. Even that'll space the court a little bit, I think, and pull some guys out. Yeah, and Zion was working for a while after practice with assistant coach Aaron Miles on that mid-range shot. However, I would like to see him attack the rim a little bit more, be aggressive, because in the win on New Year's Eve against the Lakers, mm -hmm. he went 10 of 12 from the free throw line. He was attacking the inside and trying to be physical, aggressive, and, and getting to the line to get points, whether he could actually you know, finish at the rim or not. So I think that we need to see a little bit more in that regard from Zion, and Hopefully, we can get some more guys going from outside to help with the spacing and give them that room. Yeah, you know, this is kind of Zion, this is Zion's first postseason game. You know, yeah. we could argue it's the biggest game of his career. In some of the other big games that he's played, he hasn't necessarily shown up in the way that we'd like. The in-season tournament loss in the semifinals to the Lakers kind of being the other real big one. Do you expect a, be a better game from him? He even said, right, you mentioned the aggression. He said he needs to be more aggressive in this one. And I think when we've seen him say that, he's mm -hmm. said, I need to take over at the end of games. I need to demand the ball. I need to make sure that it's in my hands in the fourth quarter. And we've seen that on occasion where that it's happened. And I think because the game was so out of hand in the fourth quarter, that's not what happened this time around. But this team is going to come out with a different mindset and mentality than they did in this past game. I mean, it's embarrassing. It is. And I think they all know that. They felt it. I mean, you can look around the crowd in the SKC yesterday, and it was dead, except if you were wearing a yellow jersey. And they don't like that. It doesn't matter how well they play on their home court. They don't want that to be the atmosphere there. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with that. And, you know, Trey Murphy said, everyone come on out. They want to see this place packed. They can kind of thrive off that energy. And they need mm -hmm. that jolt of energy, I think, at times. A guy that brings that is Najee Marshall, who didn't play in this Lakers game. Do you think he's going to be in the rotation coming into this one? Yeah, going back to that New Year's Eve game, he played 21 minutes. He was the first person off the bench. He kind of has that fight, that mentality where it doesn't matter what's going on. Sometimes, you know, you, you question some of the things that he does on the court, but he <laughs> is going to bring it. He is going to try his hardest. And the other person that stood out in that game was Jose Alvarado. He had four steals in that game on New Year's Eve, and, and that kind of riled up the crowd. It got under LeBron's skin, and they were able to turn those defensive stops into immediate points on the offensive end, which is what we really need to see more of, some of that disruption disruptive play on the defensive end. Yeah, they, they love turning defense into offense and getting out in transition and running, just getting easy buckets because at times they do struggle in the half court, but your efficiency skyrockets when you're getting out and running in transition. That also means you're not turning the ball over, which mm -hmm. is where the Lakers killed them a little bit too. Getting 19 some of those times yesterday, not yep. good. No, not good. And LeBron James is near impossible to stop in transition, and that team is really elite in that. But they're only a, like a kind of middle-of-the-road half court team, so if New Orleans can force some of those turnovers, it kind of compounds on itself and it's something that you can build off of with everything here. So Aaron, I appreciate you taking, oh, actually I have one more question for you uh -oh. on this. Going, going, no, no, this is a good <laughs> one. So, you know, they have the advantage of being the seventh seed. They can lose this game and then you play another yeah. one. Does that factor into the preparation at all or is it simply just go out and win and don't even think about playing on Friday? No, I mean, right now, like I asked Coach Green specifically about, you know, in, t in the grand scheme of things, you guys are in a much better position than you have been in the past two seasons. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, Right now, it's really hard to step back and look at that because we're so focused in right now on winning this game that we don't want to think about the fact that, yes, sure, we have the possibility of a Friday game as well. So I don't think that's something that the team wants to think about. He wants to mention because you don't want to have that like fallback plan. Mm -hmm. 
No, that's good to hear. I'm glad their, their mentality is <laughs> right for this sort of thing, you know, and it's unfortunate that whoever wins this plays the Nuggets in the first round is their reward for you it all. You got to do it at some point, though. You're going to have to play them no matter what, I think. So you may as well just try and right. get it over with. So, Aaron, thanks for taking the time with me here on a live in-person episode of Locked on Pelicans. Absolutely. I can't wait to talk to everybody afterwards. Yeah, I know. We got Rel Myers coming up here next. Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, right? Either as a player or a fan, it's halftime. The scoreboard's not looking too good like it wasn't the other night. You're feeling low, not sure if you or your team can pull out a win. But with, but that's when you dig deep, lift up your head, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's Monopoly Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with a ton of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. And there's so much to do. So you can play on countless dynamic Monopoly leaderboards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. That sounds fun. And charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play play. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast covering everything you want to know about the team. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Join almost 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube. We do live shows. We'll have a show after every postseason game, whatever that is, whenever that is. And of course, we're going to cover everything you want in the offseason, whether it's the draft, free agency, how this team needs to improve to take the next leap. But we're focused right now on the play-in tournament game, and I've got Rel Myers at Rel Myers. She's of the Pels 12, of RelMyers.com as well here. Uh, Rel, thanks for taking the time. You helped me plan all of this, so I really yeah. appreciate you and everyone being here at Mid-City Yacht Club with me tonight. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me to, you know, help out and plan this thing. So, how are you, are you feeling better today? I looked at your <laughs> podcast, I watched your show. It was a little heated in the aftermath of that. Has a day later, or a couple hours later, when, however long it is, made you feel a little bit better, worse? Where, yeah. where are you at here? Definitely felt better after getting my 12-minute <laughs> rant off my chest. Um, so I had a better night after that. And today I'm having a really good day. I'm all smiles today. So they can't hurt me today. Maybe tomorrow, maybe yesterday, but not today. <laughs> okay. Not, not, so everything's good right now. What, so what's, what do you think is kind of the general mindset of the fan base right now? This is a team that had 49 wins. They improved significantly, right? That would have been third in the Eastern Conference. It would have been third in the West last year. You know, yeah. 50 wins, if they had hit that, would have been only the second time in franchise history. For whatever reason still, it feels like the season was a bit of a disappointment. Is that kind of the general vibe that you get from it, the feeling kind of around the fan base as a whole? Well, you know, Twitter is kind of a bubble, and I spend a lot of time on Twitter, and it seems like Twitter thinks that it's a, a bit of a disappointment. Um, I feel like everyone is thinking, oh, no, not again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's some PTSD in there with things like there, that. There's a lot. We have definitely like a tortured fan base uh, as of late. So, um, But there's a lot of there's still a lot of positivity, too, in the fan base. So there's a lot of people who um, are, you know, able to zoom out a little bit and have a different perspective in terms of, you know, yeah, we had 49 wins, but unfortunately, a bunch of other teams had 49 wins too. So it's like it's not necessarily like there's there's obviously growth there. There's yeah. obviously growth. We've you know expanded on the wins by six or seven every single season. Um, so there's definitely some positives to take. But you know, there's some people who have a mindset of like I'm going to be upset about this, and so you just have to let them. You know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what do you think is kind of the let me ask you, I have a couple actually for you. What would you say is kind of the biggest X factors for each team going into this game? Ooh. Uh, uh, putting you on the spot here a little bit. Yeah, a little bit for each team, you said? X yeah, I, I'll team. give you a Laker one if you want. Uh, well, I think D'Angelo Russell's the X Factor. That's the one I would have said. Good job. <laughs> yeah, D'Lo's <laughs> the X Factor for them. For us, um, I feel like saying Zion or B.I. is a little bit of a cop-out. Um, I'm going to say Trey Murphy. They need a shooting, right? Like, yeah. you know, Aaron talked a little bit about it. Will talked a little bit about it. They need that shooting to space the court for Zion Williamson. And I'm wondering if this is one of those games where if you can't get Zion going right away, mm -hmm. do you need to go with Trey Murphy? Do you need CJ hitting his shots early on, B.I. hitting his shots early on? And then you almost close this game out with Zion Williamson a little bit yeah. once they've started to react to the way that, that 
the, the team is playing. They're going to play drop coverage in this game, and we've seen CJ really eat that up in the past. Mm -hmm. Trey can do that as well. So I don't think you're wrong. And on the D'Angelo Russell front, he's only played in three games against the Pelicans this year. Okay, yeah. And the one game he didn't play, the Pelicans won. He's averaging 21 points per game, and I think he's <laughs> averaging like three and a half threes made against New uh, Orleans too. Yeah. It feels like uh, eight and a half threes made. <laughs> it probably feels you, got, you can't let him get going. That guy, you cannot let him get going. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. So hopefully Herb, Dyson, somebody will step up, shut him down. Uh, but then you got to worry about shutting the other guys water off too. So Yeah, kind of really trying to press LeBron James, the point of attack, something like that, I think is going to be really important to just kind of disrupting the flow yeah. of their offense with everything. What, what do you think the atmosphere is going to be like in the Smoothie King Center tomorrow night? I think, uh, well, I always try to get in there right when doors you're open, one right? of like the first people in there <laughs> i gotta get in there early so if tip off at 6 30 i'm gonna be inside at like 5 31 like i'm getting <laughs> in there right away i think even going back to like let's say the spurs game a lot of fans i talked to that night were not excited about that game and then okay. look how it ended up right i feel like tomorrow we're gonna be like let's just get this over with you know but like once once we get in there right because when we're on the concourse it's different once you get yeah. in there you see the court you see the players you see what kind of energy we're looking at um by the time tip-off happens, now you're locked in. And as fans, you're ready to cheer. We're standing until we score, so on and so forth. And so I feel like the energy will shift then, but they really got to come out swinging. Otherwise, I don't think people are going to be happy. I think the boo birds might be out. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong type of birds. <laughs> the, wrong, the wrong type of birds for what you want on a Pelicans game here. Are you going to be interviewing, talking to Lakers fans before the game? I, I'm or not. Are you, are you, you're, you're focused in on the game then. Yeah, I'm focused in on our fans. So I did a poll on realmyers.com and I asked, do I do do I expose the Lakers uh, you know their fraudulent fans <laughs> do I expose their casuals or do I focus on our fans and do kind of like a season review because um, I did a quarter review and a half season review so I might as well follow that up with the full season right so I did the poll and then most people said no let's just focus on us don't give them the, the attention and I said okay fine so I wasn't able to really get anybody yesterday so tomorrow and maybe even tonight if you guys want to do a couple you know quick interviews um, I'll, I'll focus on that, but then it's, it's time to lock in for tip-off for sure. Yeah, they're going to need kind of all the energy they can get if they can feed off of something from the crowd here. I think that's going to be important, especially because, as we talked about, they're not the greatest home team here, so any sort yeah. of advantage from that I think could be a good thing. So going back to the 49 wins and it feeling like a little bit of a disappointment, like how would you grade the Pelican season so far? Oh, is man. it TBD just because we need to find out if they're actually in the playoffs or not? It's kind of TBD because in the beginning, I've been so torn on it because at first it's like, okay, do I just want to make the playoffs out right or is there like a certain amount of wins that I want to get to? But like, it's absolutely insane that they got 49 wins and they still end up in the seventh seed. So it's like it. my expectations have changed and my goals for the team have changed so much throughout the season. But, um, yeah, I think it's still TBD for me. I got to see what happens and if we can – actually get a playoff spot. I, I think it would be great. I think kind of a big goal of the season is to see Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram together in the yeah. postseason, see what that looks like in kind of that sort of atmosphere. I think that's going to be important for them going forward. Looking looking ahead a little bit to the offseason, mm -hmm. do you have like the number one thing they need to upgrade is – um, they're, they're big room. They got to upgrade somewhere with the centers. Um, I know a lot of people talk about like guard play and I think we need, um, I think we need a big more than we need a guard. I think, uh, the whole going small thing, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't work. And we don't want to necessarily like handicap ourselves to where we can't like, <laughs> we don't have any answer, you know, so we need some length. So going up against teams like the magic the other day, they got four guys that are six ten or taller. Big, big can't team. Can't do anything with that. We need to be able to send out, you know, some big guys like that. So I think they should address that first. Yeah, I think that's really what they're gonna be looking at. But first, gotta get through this play in tournament here. Gotta get hopefully through a long playoff run and then we'll look towards the off season and see where they go from here. So Rel, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Um, anything coming on RelMyers.com soon? Just more content. Uh, be on the lookout for the, the season review, and we'll see. I'm going to be asking people, if, if there's anything you want to say to the front office, what do you want to say? So get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Got a chance to make your voice heard there. So I appreciate you. I appreciate Aaron Summers. I appreciate Will Guillory coming on a live, a live in-person and live-streamed episode of Locked On Pelicans with me here. Stick around, everyone, the people who are here, the people on YouTube as well. We're going to do a live Q&A. We're going to shuffle around, get everyone up here, ask your questions, get you all set for the game tomorrow, hang out a little bit more, and get a little bit interactive with it all. So this has been the Locked On Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow with a couple of things on the YouTube channel and to recap what happened in this one.
All right, we've got the, the, the live Q&A after the live episode of Locked on Pelicans. So I appreciate everyone taking time on a Monday night. This is like the one day we get a bit of a break right now. So for you to come out and spend it with us here in the show means a lot to me, and I know the panel as well. So this part is, is really for y'all. When I do the live streamed episodes, I do the show, then open it up, and we kind of do a bonus segment for the Q&A part. So if you have questions, literally whatever they might be, you know, someone just shout one out. I can pose questions to the panel overall as well. It doesn't have to be about basketball. Like, we can just talk about whatever. There we go. <laughs> we got we have a Saints guy here, too, to answer Saints questions and That's everything. A, I'm the one that got Saints questions if we're going to talk Saints. Busy. Yeah. I got a lot of Saints do questions. Not, do not let Will Guillory come at you I got more statements than questions. <laughs> um, so, so I'll pose it to the panel to kind of get everything rolling. We just kind of go down in order here. You know, I asked Rel about kind of like X factors for this game. Like, Will, is there one thing that like jumps out in your mind that you can see swinging the game either way for the Pelicans away from the Pelicans? I think something you and Aaron talked about turnovers. I yeah. think when the Pels are playing really well, they're forcing turnovers. They're getting out of transition. And when they're bad, they're the ones turning the ball over. They're not getting their defense set. You saw that a lot against LeBron last night. I think uh, if they're going to, if they're able to disrupt that offense, if Jose can get some GTAs, they can get Dyson Daniels involved, get some steals. I think that can take some of the pressure off of their half court because I think it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment period, getting Bi back on the flow, figuring out how that works with Zion and. CJ, but if you're getting out of transition, it's just easy, right? It's just get to your spots, get to the layups. So I think that's going to be a big key for sure. Well, you kind of gave yours, but if you got another one, you can jump in. No, I don't think I have another one. Um, I think that they just they got to bring it, man. Or I might be the one leading the Boo Birds. I don't want to have to be the one to do it, you know? But I, I was pretty fed up yesterday. I felt a tear coming on, but I kept it together. <laughs> I think in, in even just listening to the team today and head coach Willie Green, that was what they focused in on was just the intensity that they need to bring from the beginning of the game, the physicality that they have to play with, the aggressiveness, because you, you can't come out the same way that you did in the last game because there's just there's not going to be a way to get back into the game against a team that is just so effective on both ends of the court. They're a lot better defensively than people really think they are because mm-hmm. you see the offensive threats that LeBron James and Anthony Davis are, and then you have the others that can hit from outside. So I think that to start the game, you really have to show them what you're going to be like physically. Like, let them feel you. Get in them and make sure that they don't have the ability to do whatever they want, especially in the paint like they did yesterday. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I think that that aggression in general, right, is going to be so key to this team here, I think. But it also goes in, they need to get to the line. They need to get to the line and get some of those easy free throws. We've all probably seen, especially y'all here, know kind of the free throw disparity that the Lakers get in the NBA compared to like any other team where I think it's if you added the second, third, and fourth team, it doesn't even equal the disparity that the Lakers have here. Mm -hmm. There was that kind of weird moment in the game where they gave the Lakers, they didn't give the Lakers two free throws. That actually, I think, should have been changed and done. It was a weird way to go about it. But that aggression is going to get you to the line and you might need that to kind of keep up with everything too. Well, the Lakers, they're top two in like every single free throw category. So that is definitely an area that they usually are better in. But in the game that the Pelicans did win, they got to the line more than the Lakers did. When it was all said and done, the Lakers definitely got the calls early, Mm -hmm. but the Pelicans brought it, and they continued to assert themselves inside, and they ended up getting to the line more. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone got something for us? Don't be shy. I can keep asking them questions. (laughs) How do you you attack him? So the question was, how do you attack Anthony Davis in drop coverage? Because that's absolutely what the Lakers are going to be running and what they do basically every single time. Is it as easy as, like, C.J. McCollum shooting over that, like he did Yusuf Nurkic in that Suns game? Is there more that needs to go into it? I think something we've seen a lot from C.J. is him coming out really aggressive in the first quarter, and I think that's something he's going to have on his mind early. Uh, I think that's one of the adjustments he's really made this year is getting himself going early, and that allows B.I. and Zion to kind of get themselves in the flow later in the game, and and he doesn't necessarily feel the need to press because he's already got himself going a little bit, and I think when you're talking about playing drop coverage, you're allowing C.J. just to step into open jumpers a lot of time, so I think that's a big key for that is forcing A.D. to step up, and the more you force A.D. to step up, the 
the more that opens up the lane for everybody else behind him, right? So I think the more CJ's hitting, that's going to make life difficult for AD. He's not going to be able to hang at the rim. That's going to make life e a lot easier for Zion because there's less traffic in the paint, right? So I think that's a big key is getting CJ going early, particularly him hitting three-pointers early, and that way that forces everybody to kind of step out a little bit, and that opens up the lane for B.I. and Z. But it's going to have to be more than just CJ, though, because, yeah. you know, Trey Murphy also is going to have to get going. Then you're going to have to get some from Herb Jones or Jose Alvarado. Somebody else also has to contribute to make sure that they continue to honor them from the three-point. Yeah, it's, it's like what I was talking about earlier. Sometimes maybe you need to not feed Zion right away, but feed some of these other guys and then close it out with Zion Williamson once they're kind of respecting some of those other players early on because – we saw them bottle Zion up a little bit. You, you had said it was maybe due to the lack of aggression from him, but he needs to have a good game, I think, for the Pelicans to win. But they've got to do something to help him as well. Yeah, I think um, a couple games ago when we played uh, Golden State, you know who the first person was to make a three that night? It was Jeremiah Robinson Earl. And then who was the second person? It was Dyson Daniels. <laughs> so you, you got to have everybody contribute. Like Aaron said, everybody's got to step up and they got to knock down these shots. I mean, CJ went four for nine from three in the last game, which isn't terrible. Right. Um, but he's always going to be the one taking the most because these other guys, like, they're a little bit timid, right? And CJ's got the most experience and he's got the most postseason experience, too. So... They've got to step up. They've got to match that um, intensity that the Lakers are going to be coming with. And, you know, CJ got out there yesterday and said, you know, thanks for your support. We've been taking care of business on the road. Now we've got to take care of business at home. And then last night they didn't. So now you really, really got to put up or shut up. We, we don't want you booing them in the Smoothie King no. Center tomorrow. <laughs> and look, and I, I support this team. You guys know. I support this team to, like, no end, right? I feel like I've earned that right to be able to boo just once. <laughs> <laughs> Just once. <laughs> you act like it's just been once. <laughs> I Look, I, I haven't been booing. I really haven't been. I wanted to, but I didn't. What else we got? So the question was, do we see him running more pick and rolls between uh, Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson? Maybe just more actions in general kind of involving those guys. Yeah, I mean, I can talk to that, not to be specific about anything, but to pra in practice today, they, they talked a lot more about – how they're running their offense, a lot more backdoor cuts, a lot more pick and roll action, and making sure that they are playing with a little more pace, moving the ball around differently. So definitely look for it more on the offensive side, but on the other side as well, they are going to defend the Lakers pick and roll a little bit differently. And I don't know if you want to like say how, how you think, but I'll be like, Ed I Daniels right now. <laughs> <laughs> now, I would love to hear you talk uh, something that we see a lot, and we post it every now and then on Twitter, uh, James Borrego's role and some of the adjustments they make. We saw today uh, B.I. and Trey working out, doing some stuff together after practice, and the amount of thought, just like, you know, the question was about getting these guys involved together and how they can work off each other, how they can complement each other, and how much James Borrego has played a part in that. How much have you seen that this year? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to – who does what during practice you know Borrego is the guy that's talking through the offensive plans and what they're going to be doing you know he's the one as I mentioned that stepped out with you know the whiteboard of the, if this then that and this and all you know all the different options and I think that's what I've enjoyed about seeing his role evolve throughout this season is they're not just saying hey this is what we're going to run and you have to stick to it but he's like if this is what the plan is, but this happens. These are your options around it, you know? And it, in practice today, there was a moment where, you know, the defense did something and the offense adjusted and the Pelicans starting five was on offense and they made the right read. And, and Coach Green stopped everybody and said, yeah, that's absolutely something that the Lakers may do to you on defense. And that was a, a perfect way to get out of that situation and end up with a score so I think it's helping all of the players evolve better you know as far as understanding the game and knowing the different things that they might uh, see against a certain opponent and then how they can play off of that and around it no I think I, I got nothing to add that was perfect <laughs> <laughs> but to your point after practice Brega was working specifically with Brandon Ingram and what they were working on was his three-point shots and, and mm -hmm. how he could get open for those. Yeah. They've been begging him to take them well, the whole season. Uh, that, that's important, right? It comes to, you know, they kind of had that magic number of 40, right, as three-point attempts, which I think it's actually a more lower number that they're really targeting probably in that 35 range. 
but it can't be in that mid-20 range that we've right. seen from them. They need to take threes. There's a little bit of risk of live and die by the three in that, which could happen, but it's also the NBA in 2024. 20, like, that's that's a thing here. But, you know, because you have a star player in Zion Williamson who doesn't take threes, you, you need to find those threes elsewhere. Because it also can become a math game, right? Mm-hmm. You've seen Austin Reeves making those threes. De- DeAndre Russell is going to make threes against this team, you know, till the end of time, I think, when it comes to it. You need to keep up with that. You can't keep trading, you know, twos for threes because you're even if you're going shot for shot at that point, you're losing ground on that sort of thing. Well, the Pelicans outshot them from three Sunday. Mm-hmm. However, it was the turnovers that killed them. Mm-hmm. Regardless of how dominant the Lakers were inside, you know, the three-point line, it can be the great equalizer. Yep. And if the Pelicans can get hot from outside, it doesn't matter how many twos the Lakers are getting. Yeah, exactly. What else do we have from the audience here? What, what was it again? <laughs> yeah, is there, is there, the question is, is there any chance that Darren? we see a tweak to the starting lineup? I will say that Jonas Valanciunas has started every single game this season. Yep. And regardless of how many minutes he gets, he still starts. Yep. So if you're a starter in the NBA and you have earned that cred, then you're going to start in the NBA. I agree. I think uh, it's going to be the same starting lineup. I think uh, as much as we've seen Willie embrace change this year, there are certain things he's not going to change, and I think the start lineup's one of them. Uh, I think he. I think early in games he wants to see how JV looks. If he can get JV going, if you can get JV a couple buckets early, his changes his mindset the whole rest of the game. He's hitting the boards more. His defense is better. But I think there's been a few times, and I think Willie deserves credit for this. If JV doesn't have it, he just says, "All right, I'm done with JV. We're going to Larry Nance." And I think. The Phoenix game, a lot of people were like, damn, JV only got three minutes, but it ended up being the right decision because he didn't have it. They were forcing him to take open shots. He wasn't making them. They went small, and it worked. And like I said earlier, against this particular Lakers team, this that strategy probably won't work because playing small against them is probably futile. But I think he wants to see if he can get JV going, and I think this is a matchup where if JV has one of those 18 and 11 games, it'll make a big difference. You know, the, the Lakers are probably going to play single coverage on JV with Anthony Davis, and I don't think that's a great JV matchup there. But he also still a big guy. If you can get an extra foul or two on Anthony Davis, that can kind of change things where all of a sudden you can hit the paint a lot harder. Zion has a little bit more room to work if he has to sit out with foul trouble. One of the things that was kind of disappointing on Sunday was they couldn't win those minutes when Anthony Davis was off the mm-hmm. floor. They need to be able to do that in this game. And if you can keep him off the floor longer – Hope, you know, with fouls potentially, I think that's a way that they could maybe gain a little bit of an advantage. And AD coming in with a little bit of a bad back too, had some spasms at the end of that game. Yeah. <laughs> I saw some of y'all wanting me to send uh, Anthony Davis to the locker room tweet during the game. <laughs> I stayed away from that. <laughs> no, but I will say to your point about Anthony Davis in the one game that the Pelicans were able to win, they got him in for foul yep. trouble. Mm-hmm. He had four fouls midway through the third quarter, so he was off the court for a while, and they were able to take advantage of those minutes. JV played 25 minutes in that game, but Larry Nance also played a heavy rotation, and he had 11 points, 10 rebounds, so he was also very effective in those minutes. Right. If you look at Larry, Cody Zeller, in yesterday's game, I don't know how much it would have mattered to mm-hmm. have JV on the floor. So I think you do have to kind of go off feel and, and how the game is going. And for whatever reason, they felt like Larry was still the, the better option in yesterday's game. So we'll see if they do change that at all, give JV a few more minutes tomorrow. But expecting the same starting lineup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I had a choice, I would have addressed it at practice. <laughs> but yeah, Bray goes in charge of the offense. Aaron runs watching. the defense. If y'all didn't know. <laughs> um, so the question was basically, LeBron got what he wanted in the paint and kept driving and attacking, which led to those assists in the beginning. You know, was there a focus on taking charges? Or how, you know, what do they need to do to kind of contain that a little bit? The more? primary focus was on preventing them from getting inside and protecting the paint first. 
and making sure that was the the primary focus and then flying out to the shooters. So I would hope that the seas do not part tomorrow and it's going to be a little bit different. I think that they are going to make sure that they have bodies in front, pack the line, whatever you want to do um, to make sure it's not as easy for them to get to the rim. Is there is there a cor- like a correlation to the Pelicans' right. play, let's say, with Larry Nance Jr. versus Jonas Valanciunas? Do they tend to win their games more if one's playing versus the other? I think I'd say when we've seen the very best version of this Pelicans team, it's been with Larry on the floor. I think, and I think a big part of it is, like I said, they're at their best when they're being disruptive. They're causing steals. They're getting out in transition. I think Larry is a big part of that. Uh, how he's got such great hands and drop coverage. He can switch. He can keep guys in front of him. Uh, that's a big part of, like we said, keeping guys out of the paint. I think we're going to see Larry switching a lot more. I think we talked about B.I. coming back. I think it was slept on that Larry was also coming back after missing a few games. He was out of his rhythm. Uh, so I think getting a full practice for him is going to help uh, just getting him in a, just in a better place going into that game. So, uh, I, like I said, we all know that JV is a very good center. We've seen him have some great games. Of course, his numbers are usually going to look better than Larry in the box score. But I think just the way this team is built, how they need to play, what they need to do to be at their best, I think Larry complements the rest of those guys the best way. Uh, and I think the, the one tough thing with Larry is, like, he's not a guy that you're going to give 35 minutes, you know, just because I think there's, you know uh, – it's just not going to be good returns after a while. I think he's a guy that's kind of a ceiling on how much you can play him. Uh, but I do think when he's really, you know, causing turnovers on defense, he's getting involved in the offense, hitting the little corner three every now and then, I think that makes the game a lot easier for the rest of those guys. I think he's a player that doesn't necessarily show up in the stat sheet. It's more of his basketball IQ and the way that he communicates and tells people where to be and what to do. Because – he is one of the smartest players I think that I've come across. And not only when he's on the court, but he is pulling players aside on the bench constantly talking through things. I saw him a couple games ago grab a computer from one of the guys, the assistant coaches behind the bench and, and pull up a play and sit there and walk Dyson Daniels through it. And I think that you, you can't you know overlook how somebody impacts the game at that level. Obviously, he's a little more athletic than JV as far as his ability to get back defensively, and I think that's where they lean on him more. Yeah, you know, their their whole defensive scheme is about switching, and they don't really have a true rim protector on this team, but they still have the sixth best defense, and one of the reasons is they don't really let people get into the paint very often. I think that Lakers game with LeBron James and what he was doing is not necessarily the norm there, you know. While you'd like a shot blocker, you know, potentially back at the rim, if you just don't let someone get into the paint in the first place, they can't really score there. And that's allowed them to force a lot of those turnovers, get out in transition and run. And when you score, your defense can get back and get set. This is something I talk a lot about on Locked On Pelicans. And then it allows you to force more turnovers. So it's this cycle that kind of keeps going and going. And I think that's why you see the best version of the Pelicans. I agree with Will. I don't have, like, the numbers of, like, do they win more games when Larry plays more minutes or if JV plays more minutes. But if you're looking for this team to kind of be at their best, I definitely think it's with Larry Dance Jr. on the floor or maybe in the offseason an entirely different starting center as they look to, you know, upgrade at the trade deadline with everything. Yeah. So the question is is kind of a general media question of, you know, the team tends to be a little bit secretive at times. I think you see that. No. You know, our roles as media <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, you know, one, how hard is it to get access? Or how does that also, like, inform kind of the coverages that we all do? Like, the content that we put out, I think, too, because there's a factor of, you know, do you talk about something? Do you kind of hint at something and all of that? Uh, I think... I think that's something that Ross probably has more difficulty with than us because I think 
football in general. I'm not going to speak on the Saints. Uh, but football in general, I think they kind of treat it like they're protecting, like, government secrets over there for whatever reason. Uh, as if it's just, like, run it up the middle. Uh, but I, I just think, you know, I think one thing is something I've learned just over, just over time is that a big part is just the relationships you've built. Uh, the, the people, uh, the, I'm fortunate just because the Pelicans have a lot of the same people that have been around for years, so we kind of get to know them, they get to know us. There's a level of trust that's built over time. Uh, there's a certain experiences you go through where you say, okay, I probably shouldn't listen to what this person has to say or this person has been honest with me. And I think a lot of times you put trust in the person and you end up looking like a fool in the end. So I think it, it's a, it comes with experience, it comes with learning the people who are working around you, but I think also a big part that I try to do and take pride in is that uh, just ha just moving in a certain way. I think, you know, people recognize the stuff you do on Twitter. They recognize the, the stuff you post in on your website or, you know, and I think, you know, a lot of times people will run up on me and just be like, yo, North Carolina, man, I saw you wilding on the Saints on Sunday. You know, it have nothing to do with basketball and you could develop relationships that way. Uh, and, and I think that kind of evolves in the, you talking basketball or, you know, what's going on with Willie, what's the free agent moves. Uh, but I think a big thing is just developing relationships over time, kind of establishing who you are in the business, how you move, and that allows them to put more trust in you and what they say to you, uh, how they say things to you. And I think that kind of allows that, you know, river of information to flow. And I think at the end of the day, it's, it's better for everybody, right? Because the, the fans want to know what's going on. They don't want to be kept in the dark. Uh, they want the approval of the fans as much as they act like they don't. They, wanna, they want you guys coming through to events like this and saying nice stuff about the team. They don't want you, you know, calling guys you know, names on Twitter and stuff like that. I was about to say something crazy. Yeah, don't say no names, don't say no names. <laughs> but nah, I think, you know, they want all of this to kind of work together, but also they want to protect certain things, which is understandable. Uh, but I think just having those relationships in place, I think makes it a lot easier for everybody. Rel, do you have any thoughts? I'm not allowed in the building, so. Uh. <laughs> Yo, what y'all no, is, I mean, <laughs> Rel be having better seats than me at a lot of events. It's not a lot. Like, it's not a, a lot. lot of events. It happened literally twice. Nah, I remember <laughs> at least four times. But, nah, that's, but nah, that's debatable. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. No, I, I mean, I don't really have anything to add as far as, like, getting access to certain things. Um, when I was doing the content management for um, Pelican's Lead, I had they applied for me to get um, media credentials, and that was denied for whatever reason. I think they have a small media room, whatever have you. So it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I will say being on the inside and working for the team doesn't mean I have full access. You know, there are definitely still things that they want to keep just within the team for just whatever reason. They want to make sure that it's just – it's them and, and it's their family and their tight knit group that, that knows these things. And there are times, yeah, I lo I'm looked at as a media member as well. And I think it took me a little while, even as somebody who is on the payroll to be trusted, to be around and at certain events. And honestly, there's a lot of times where I'm like, Hey, y'all know you pay me. Like if I say something, I can get, you can fire me. Like, I'm not going to say anything. Like I'm not going to jeopardize that. But I get it. You know, there's, there's, you can't trust everybody fully. And so on the opposite side of it, before I, I was, you know, on the team side, it is a lot of developing those relationships, but also figuring out who you can trust because you don't want to just run with something that somebody said because, oh, my best friend's uncle's mom told me that I, they saw somebody here. And you're like, okay, cool. So that means they're in crutches and not playing ever again. You're going to get roasted for that. So you definitely have to find multiple sources to corroborate things and make sure you develop that trust as well with the people before you go out there and say something. And then you don't want to just say things because then on the opposite side, the organization will come back and be like, we're never talking to you again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that because yesterday in my rant on Pells and Whistles, um, I had mentioned something about somebody being out the night before doing something, and people are like, well, so who was it? And I'm like, you know what, I'm not. I was just upset, and I heard it. I don't know if it's true. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pretend that I didn't say that. <laughs> That's probably why I got denied. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, 
there's there's like a balance to it, right? I think you know, especially Will, who does a little bit more like journalism than like what I do with the podcast and everything. Like, <laughs> you want to get a lot of the truth out there and kind of do your job with all of that, but at the same time, you do need to keep these type of relationships intact to get that information to kind of inform your coverage with everything. And so it's about kind of finding you know a way to get people to trust you, and that's kind of being balanced in the coverage with everything, right? Never too high, never too low when it comes to all of that. And that's where you start to learn a lot of that information from folks once they see the work that you put out, consistency with that, they start to trust you through that, I think, at first. And then over time, you know, you start to get some of that info and it can sh you know, shape your coverage, but it's how much do you say, how much do you not say, right? Even to Rel's example, like, oh, you, you know, this person was out partying or whatever it might be, is that the right thing to put out there, even if it is relevant, or how do you kind of like thread it into all of that? And, you know, this team, look, it, it, the NBA's big business, right? Everyone's trying to get any sort of competitive advantage, and they might think a piece of information is a competitive advantage, even if we don't think it is, right? Mm -hmm. You know. The, I think the big thing is coming out in The Athletic with Sam Amick, right, the Willie Green extension, which wasn't previously reported. Shout out to Athletic. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, Sam used to come on Locked on NBA all the time, actually. That's my guy, man. I love yeah, Sam. He's great. Uh, so, you know, they kept that quiet for a reason, whatever that reason was, and I'm sure they feel there's a valid reason for that. So it's trying to kind of walk that line of, like, was it, was it not? How do you kind of approach it with that? Because we don't see the complete picture for mm -hmm. everything, too, a lot of the time. You know, and so I think that, that kind of factors into how do you go about this as well. It's a lot different now with the way that betting has just exploded, too. Because I know I have to go through multiple courses throughout the season, you know, by, through the NBA and the NFL to make sure that none of us within the building that are on staff are tipping or saying anything to anybody that could help or hurt somebody's you know, bet. Obviously, we're not allowed to bet. The only thing I'm allowed to bet on is horse racing, which is not my jam. That's Joel Myers. Joel, if anybody Joel, ever Joel, wants Joel, tips Joel. On, on horse it racing. It can become your jam. It can be, I bet on hockey all the time. I don't watch hockey. I win, though. It's, it's it's I'll actually be winning. wild. Like, if I only worked for the an NBA team, I could bet on anything except for the NBA, WNBA, and G League. Oh, okay. But working for an NFL team, it's like, nope, only horses. Man. Yeah. Uh, shout out FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. Hey, <laughs> FanDuel. So, Ross, you have any thoughts on uh, GMs who chew gum at press conferences or some of that sort? or? Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not have any gum up here for the panel to, to chew uh, as, as we were talking here. No, but one thing I do want to say, uh, and this is just me getting on my soapbox, because one of my, I, I ran about this, and Aaron has probably heard me rant about this post game too. One of the, the tweets I get a lot, uh, especially after games last night, is, Yo, Will, why you don't ask tough questions at the press conference? You will. You got to get on Willie tonight, dog. Tonight is the night. And I'm like, <laughs> 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 And I'm like, what I want to tell people a lot of times is my job isn't to ask a question that's going to get me on Twitter or get people talking about me. My job is to get a question that's going to get an answer. And a lot of times, I might go into a press conference and you just got to read the room and be like, yeah, Zion just doesn't want to talk tonight. And I, can, and I can just keep hitting him with questions and keep trying to get him to talk about this and that. But if he don't want to talk, he's not going to talk. And I think over time, like I said, building relationships with the front office is the same as building relationships with players, right? We're all people at the end of the day. You got to read what they're about, what they, how they feel, what they care about, you know, what they don't want to talk about, what they're comfortable with. Certain, like Brandon Ingram is a guy, if he sees Cameron around he's probably not gonna open up that much you catch bi by himself one of the coolest dudes you'll ever find he'll talk to you about anything i think with certain guys you got to learn the right setting the right time the right situation to talk to them and that's when you'll get the most out of them and i think one of my favorite compliments i get a lot is when people say will guys are really open willing to open up to you right they're willing to talk to you they're willing to say certain things to you that they don't say to certain people and i think getting to that point is it, it requires just an understanding of like like I said just just time situation and how to talk to guys when to ask certain questions because at, at the end of the day what we're here to do is to get the answers that y'all want to hear right y'all want more information y'all want to know what these guys are thinking why they're making certain decisions but 
we're not going to always get those answers when we want to get them. After the tough loss, after the heartbreaking road trip, we want to know why you messed this up. It's not going to happen that night all the time. But if you're able to you know, treat them in a certain way, talk to them, show them you have a certain level of knowledge, they'll open up to you and you'll get those answers eventually. It's just not going to be right after they lost by 40 to the Lakers. They're not going to talk to you about pick and roll coverage, right? Yeah, I also, there's two things I want to kind of piggyback off of that. You know, the first and foremost one is like, look, I, I think we're all up here really smart when it comes to basketball and the NBA, but these coaches probably know more than we do. The players know more than we do. So I think a lot of people would like us going into some of these press conferences and kind of grilling the coaches, the players of like, why did you do this wrong and kind of frame it that way. And as Will said, it's about getting an answer and you're not going to get that answer when you act like you know more than the head coach of the team per se, especially because we're not seeing the full practices or anything like that. We don't know a lot of the thought process, the decision making. We want to ask questions that kind of get that out to shed some more light on it for y'all, a little bit more transparency when it comes to things. But I'd also talking to them on the podcast I think it's a little bit different like I don't want to come off like I know more than you Willie Green or something along those lines because I don't frankly right uh, another thing though that kind of hits on everything we were talking about is you know a lot of whether it's the front off or the coaches or the players like they want correct information out there and they're willing to talk to us with that well you were telling we were talking about this the other day about an unnamed Eastern Conference team where their head coach does a film session with the media before the season starts so that they understand the offense that's being run so that when it's being critiqued or talked about, right, like they'll get it right and they understand really more about what's going on. And by the way, this isn't a team that's begging for media coverage no, either. No, not at all. Like they, they get all the media they could ever ask for, and this coach goes out of his way to bring the media in, show them films, show them why they do certain things, and it's to educate the media, it's to it, allow the media to educate the fans. It's a it's a circle. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like they want the right things out there. There's definitely some that want to control a narrative, maybe push an agenda or a narrative out there. But I think in general people understand that, like, Y'all, the fans, are what makes this work, and you have a right to information and want to know certain things and want it to at least be correct and not factually incorrect information when it comes to certain things. Yeah, because somebody will remind you over and over <laughs> and every day if you get something wrong. Trey Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> he came at me again today. I know Will was there for he it. He did. He did. Uh, Trey's a character. That's all I'll say. Uh, we got time for, like, one or two more. So the question is, if the Pelicans win tomorrow, let's no, let when? When, oh, I'm when? sorry. When, <laughs> when the Pelicans right. win tomorrow, when? what's the matchup with Denver with Denver look like? Aaron. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Pelicans six. <laughs> there you go. I I am not as scared of them as a lot of people are. I think we played them pretty well this season. They're beatable. Yeah. Yeah. We just gotta like play forty eight minutes of basketball. Four times at least. <laughs> a minimum of four times. I know they have gotten better as the season's gone on since we have seen them, and they are a different animal when it comes to playoff basketball. But, again, like at some point you're probably going to have to play them. Right. So you might as well play them earlier off more rest because if you win tomorrow, then you're going to get four days before you actually have to play them, yeah. four days to figure out what to do against them. I don't know. I'm not as worried about them. Yeah, a lot of people are saying OKC is a better, easier matchup for anybody, and that's why people are throwing out the idea that the Lakers are going to throw the game tomorrow, which is crazy. wild. Insanity. <laughs> but I think, first off, we all know Jokic is a monster. Jokic is going to be a major problem for them or anybody else in the whole league. He's just about to win his third MVP, well-deserving. Uh, I'm going to vote for him for MVP. But I think – Will know, is actually the only – media here in the New Orleans area. You hold the vote I, for a I, I do hold the vote. And you're worried about where I'm vote. sitting at and he voting for MVP and stuff. That's crazy. 
Uh, I do hold the vote, and I'm going to go ahead and so let y'all in. Jones, I, I am putting um, Herb Jones' first team all defense. Let's go. Yeah, shout, out to, shout out to Herb Jones. Go. I will be putting the first team all defense. But no, I think uh, the one thing is for sure that Jokic is going to be a problem, but I think on the other end, they don't really have a whole lot of answers for Zion. I think they're going to put Aaron Gordon on him, but I think he's shown that he's he has zero fear for Aaron Gordon. Jokic isn't a guy who really does a great job of protecting the rim. I think he's going to be a big body in there who's going to you know, grab a whole lot of rebounds, but he's not going to stop Z from getting to his spot. So I think that's a matchup where I think we could really see Z uh, be one of those guys where every year in the first round we see that young dude come out and explode. Like we saw Anthony Edwards. We kind of see one guy every year, and I think Z definitely has the potential to be that guy this year, even if they do play the Nuggets. But I, I think, you know, just in the big picture, I think – Playing the series against the Nuggets will be good for them just to learn. Like like I said earlier, one of the issues with the team is that we've seen them play really well, but they haven't been able to sustain it, right? And I think going against the Nuggets, that's a team that's brutally consistent in what they do night to night. They know who they are. They know if they're down by five in the fourth quarter, what it's going to take to win that game, how they got to execute. And the Pelicans just haven't figured that out yet and having to see that Game one, game two, game three, game four, I think kind of learning from them and having to live up to the standard they bring every night is going to have is going to force the Pelicans to learn some of the things that they need to learn. And I think you've seen in the past where you're an underdog team going against a top team, you go through that experience of playing the playoffs, and you come back a whole different team the next year because you kind of take so many lessons from that. So I think that will be a good thing for them even if they do end up going against the defending champs is they can learn from some of the things that make that team so great and kind of apply it to who they can be next year. Well, speaking to that experience, if you look at what C.J. McCollum has been doing, just even over the last 10 games of the season, he's averaging 27 and a half points. He's really taken a, a new identity on. I think he's like, I've been there. I want to get back to the playoffs. It's majority of the time he's been there playing for a very long time. So He's kind of taken over, turned it up a notch. He's shooting more from outside. He's done a lot more to get this team there. I think what's going to be really fun is seeing what Zion Williamson does in the postseason. He's never, five years now, never played in a postseason game. So tomorrow night will be the first time. And I know we talked about it earlier. You know, how is he going to come out after a lackluster performance on Sunday? And I think it's going to mean a little bit more for him, not just because of the way that he played Sunday, but because this is the first opportunity for him to show what he can do in the postseason on a big stage. And they remember Vegas, that's for sure. They got, I'm, I'm sure they heard a whole lot about Vegas the past 24 hours, and they're going to try to come out and, and not let that happen again. You know what I mean? Look, I think to Aaron's point, right, like you're, you, if you want to win a title this year, you're going to have to play Denver. It's really as simple as that. So get it out of the way. But, you know, this season right now, I think at least the next step is to kind of get data on Zion and VI in the postseason. How do they work when the game's officiated differently, when you're running shorter rotations? You know, we haven't been able to see that. You've seen them play a lot this season. They've missed time together, though, too. Kind of getting it on the biggest stages of their preparation. How do you game plan with those guys? How can they be schemed out by an opponent, too, I think is important to kind of understand. And that's going to shape a lot of the off-season plans and what they want to do going forward as well because they're kind of hitting a pretty crucial time when the, when you look at the salary cap and everything with this team. Uh, so we got time for one more here. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was the luxury tax with the Pelicans right now. They just signed Matt Ryan for the for one final game of the regular season of the active roster. So his salary is prorated. So I think that keeps them below the luxury tax special. They were close. I think they were within like half a million dollars of the luxury yeah, tax. Yeah, they were super close. I don't have the, the cap sheet in front of me that I have, but they were they were right there. Basically signing a, a, a player for the full year would have put them over. But because it was one game prorated, it keeps them under. So they get him on the postseason roster, which I think is really important too. So the Pelicans are one of two teams in NBA history that have never paid the luxury tax, the other being the Charlotte Hornets here. You know, if they want to really be competitive going forward with a very expensive core of Zion Williamson, Brandon Ingram, C.J. McCollum, Trey Murphy is going to be in extension talks. 
Brandon Ingram has one more year left on his deal but can sign an extension. Now, this team is right there next year for the luxury tax. So do we – I don't know if Aaron can even talk about this one here. Well, the only thing that I can say is that Gail Benson has said that if the team is close – then they will go over the luxury tax. They're, they're okay with doing that. But what defines close? Do you see that this season? Do they get to second round? Is that close? I don't know. Um, so that's kind of the iffy part about it. Because um, obviously, like, if you feel like you just need a little bit more money, you want to keep this person here for a, a little bit longer, then you're going to win a championship, then, yeah, let's do it. But, you know, that's going to kind of be something that's going to be debated by not only, obviously, her saying yes to spending the money, but people like David Griffin and, and Trajan Langdon and, and others saying that they also think it's a good idea. They're going to be pushing for it, obviously, but um, it's going to come down to her and, and Dennis Lausha to decide that that's what they want to do. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I'm of the belief that if I was an owner, I wouldn't want to pay the luxury tax if my team wasn't a real championship contender. So until they can prove they can get beyond where they are currently, I wouldn't, you know, be in a rush to pay the luxury tax. I just think that's just the reality of, you know, having a team in New Orleans and the, this new CBA and how it works and how, you know, how much, you know, it hurts teams to, to be a luxury tax payer. Uh, but I do think – a lot of time when we talk about luxury taxes, about how much you're willing to spend to go out and get somebody to add to this current core. I think the luxury tax conversation is how much are they going to be willing to keep this current core together? And I think that's going to be the big question because we've seen the past two trade deadlines where there's a lot of talk about this guy, that guy, how they're going to improve. And they kind of sent a message that we love this core. We love these guys. We love how they mesh together. We don't want to break it up. And that works. And, and, I, and we've been in the locker room. We know these dudes love each other. I love being around these guys. It's, a, it's an amazing locker room. The chemistry is it's everything you, you guys hear about, what you see on videos. They are really that tight. They really love playing together that much. But, you know, over time, you got to pay Herb Jones. You got to pay Trey Murphy. Jose Alvarado is going to want his money. Najee Marshall is going to want some money this summer. So I think you got to make some tough decisions about – how many of these guys you're going to keep. And I think a big part of that is what does Zion look like in the postseason? Can he be the best guy on the championship level team? Can Brandon Ingram be that Jamal Murray to his Nikola Jokic? And I think that's something that those guys are going to have to prove. And until they make that jump and show they can compete at that level, I can understand why the ownership might be a little hesitant to pay everybody all the money they want just to be the seventh seed. You know, I, I think it also comes down to timing on when to do it, too. You know, I don't think this is a team that's regularly going to pay the luxury tax necessarily. I think they certainly will at some point, particularly if they're close, whatever, however that's defined as. But when you look at how the new, the second apron and the way the new collective bargaining agreement works, you know, there's a shelf life on a couple current teams. The Boston Celtics almost have to blow up their team in a year or two. The Phoenix Suns aren't right. far behind that then, too. Is it better to wait another year, not pay the luxury tax, and then try and kind of time a move when some of these teams have to basically sell off really good players for a little bit cheaper for salary cap relief because of how punitive the restrictions are on team building in the future? And that's why you're seeing a couple teams right now go all in. Grayson Allen getting paid is an example of that because they had to. That's essentially almost like a $150 million deal that they're paying. He doesn't get that money, but... That's, that's what it is with the luxury tax. You can't keep doing that for forever. So there's going to be a time when guys are available. And I think that's why it was smart that the Pelicans ducked the luxury tax this season because there was no need to pay it, knowing that there's going to be a better opportunity to try and strike if you have that kind of commitment from ownership with it all. I think it's hilarious that fans are like, yes, we got to pay the luxury tax. We got to Why don't you guys do this? But also fire the coach, get rid of this player. We don't want that player. We don't want this player. Can we get somebody else? True it's point like, guard. what do you guys really want? Like, wins. What are, we, what are we doing? Wins. We want wins. I was going to say, I think, they, I think they want them to beat the Lakers on Tuesday night. And yeah. Play tournament. Can but, we just focus on that? Yeah, I think we can all agree on that. So that's where we're going to wrap it up here for the Q&A part for the live show. So 
huge thank you to Will, to Rel, to Aaron here, and a big thank you to all y'all. Yeah, thank you guys for coming yeah, out. Yeah, for coming out on a Monday night. There's a million other things you could be doing here, but it's fun talking basketball with everybody here. And Yo, we got to shout out Theo, the in arena Theo, MC yeah, for the yeah. Pelicans yeah. in the building. And obviously I'm sure Ross. everybody here yeah. got a free t-shirt from Theo <laughs> at some point this year. Yeah. So shout out Theo. Shout out to Ross. Ross Jackson, <laughs> host of Locked on Saints, running the show over here, making us all look good. So I appreciate y'all. Yeah, I got to do it here. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast in on YouTube as well. Um, this has been Locked on Pelicans, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.